<coughs> Thank you for this very nice uh, introduction. And Shalom, Chara Tzorayim Tobin. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a uh, great pleasure, pleasure to be here today. Well, actually, this is my first time uh, at the University of Maryland. And I would like to share with you some of my views concerning this most astonishing Jewish historical figure that lived in one of the transformative centuries uh, in Jewish history, the 18th century. Uh, there's a new interest in medicine in America and in Germany, and it's a very important uh, issue. We just discussed it uh, uh, earlier. We would like to understand this new uh, interest, especially, again, in Germany and in America, not so much in, in Israel. It's another uh, issue. And um, I believe that uh, the revision of this is of his historical meaning tells us a lot, um, not just about identities and, and interests among the public, but a lot about the new trends in today's scholarship. And I believe that in this conference, you're going to see uh, some of these uh, uh, new trends. Uh, so I would like to thank the organizers, and especially Professor Charles Mannequin, for the initiative and for the invitation. So Mendelssohn is now also here at in Maryland University. Uh, so please join me now for a short journey to all Europe just a few years before the enormous political earthquake caused by the French Revolution. And let's try to decipher the Mendelssohn enigma, looking through a few windows which I would like to open here. Moses Mendelssohn died in his home at 68 Spandau Straße in Berlin on early morning, January the 4th, 1786, attracted a great deal of attention. The news from Berlin was rapidly transmitted via the communication networks of the German Republic of Letters. Jews and non-Jews alike expressed in print and in personal letters their deep sorrow at the death of the famous philosopher who for three decades had played a key role in the public sphere of enlightened Europe. This seemingly trivial historical fact encapsulated the major significance of what I would term the Mendelssohn event. Mendelssohn was a famous celebrity in the most modern sense. The Jewish boy who followed his rabbi from Dessau to Berlin when he was only 14 years old in order to study the Talmud, transformed in the 1750s into a German philosopher. But he soon became not just a public figure, but also no less than a cultural icon. Many were familiar with his face, which was sketched, painted, sculpted, or etched. His writings were read by many and transla translated into several languages, and his home attracted numerous visitors. Mendelssohn lived in the limelight, and his words were transmitted via the networks of conversation held in salons, coffee houses, and even spas as well as in letters and periodicals, and the emerging modern public of the 18th century had great expectations of him and regarded him as no less than the leader and spokesman of the entire Jewry. However, behind what looks like a camp of fans and admirers, during his lifetime and more loudly after his death, whisper of suspicion, accusations, denunciations, and doubts circulated. Would he like his friend Lessing, an alleged admirer of the infamous Spinoza? Was he a deist who was undermining the foundation of religion? Was he trying to poison the minds of young Jews with new ideas? The high society lady Elisa Reimers, for example, reported that the Jews in Hamburg held Madison in contempt, and when his name was mentioned, he was denounced as Mamluk, a traitor maybe, an apostate. In her view, all his efforts on behalf of his people were in vain, and perhaps he was esteemed by only a few non-Orthodox Christians. Even Berlin, in Berlin he enjoyed the support of the local rabbi, Zvi Hirschwedin, in Hamburg, Rabbi Raphael Cohen, one of Mendelssohn's fierce rivals, enjoyed greater influence. The following event is even more interesting. About a year and a half after Mendelssohn's death, an eyewitness reported on a scandal 
in the Breslau Synagogue on Rosh Hashanah 1787. During the sermon, Rabbi Leibush noticed a clean-shaven man, man among the worshippers. He lost his temper, denounced him as heretic, and demanded he leave the synagogue immediately. After his orders were carried out, Leibush continued to preach against what he recognized as an unbearable spread of religious laxity and placed the blame on no other than Mendelssohn, as he shouted excitedly, May his name be wiped out and his memory be eradicated. The witness, Moshe Hirscher, himself a radical deist, who described the incident to the German public in a periodical published in Nuremberg, could not understand how such a thing could happen in the age of enlightenment. How could an ignorant rabbi, as he called him, for whom the writings of the German Socrates were a sealed book, there to publicly, publicly condemn a man whom the entire world, including the rulers of Russia, presents as the very embodiment of wisdom and virtue. Observing these conflicting images from the perspective of over 200 years, we realize that Mendelssohn was not the leader of Jewish modernization, that he cert and that he certainly was not behind a conspiracy to destroy Judaism. That's what we can learn from the recent uh, 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 scholarship. The tension between demonization on the one hand and glorification on the other is mainly a reflection of a profound historical tension of which Mendelssohn was only a symbol. But when Mendelssohn died in Berlin at the end of the 18th century, he was immediately reborn to eternal life. This time, he was not born in the form of the living historical man. The Jew was surprised by the distinguished status he had achieved, who wanted most of all to disappear at times from the public eye, to philosophize privately and enjoy the warmth of his close family, his beloved young wife, Fromet, and their six children. Instead, he was reborn as a mythological figure. When the Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn event became the focus of the Jewish culture war, the entire baggage of modern Jewish history was loaded on the rather narrow shoulders of this incredible Jewish intellectual. It seems to me, however, that in the year 2011, we are already in a different place than uh, uh, we were in 1786, or even in 1870, when the prominent historian of the Jewish people, Heinrich Gretz, described Mendelssohn <coughs> as the founder of the Haskalah, the pioneer of emancipation, and a modern savior who resurrected the Jewish people and rescued them from the Dark Era. But something dramatic has recently taken place that calls for our attention. In the last 20 years, a significant revision has taken place in the way modern Jewish history is understood. A key trend in that revision is the rethinking of the role played by the Haskalah and by Mendelssohn in the process of Jewish modernization. If there was a consensus in the classical historiography, from Gretz to Jacob Katz, that placed the Haskalah at the center of the nearly every narrative of trans transition from the old to the modern era. In our own time, in our own time, there is a clear tendency to greatly reduce the importance of the Haskalah, or to describe it as moderate, conservative, and more religious. I believe that by employing the concept religious enlightenment, you're going to hear about it uh, 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 later by Professor David Sorkin, uh, and presenting Moses Mendelssohn as a Jewish religious uh, 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 and enlightenment in his thinking and his place in history, the religious turn has also become part of contemporary, contemporary Haskalah study. Taking all this into consideration, all these images, the, all the historiography, and what's going on uh, in most modern uh, historiography on the topic, uh, and uh, um, uh, I, I would like to challenge uh, a little bit this religious turn and to argue that the Haskalah was a project of secularization and that Mendelssohn's enlightenment was secularizing 
in the simple <coughs> meaning of changing the place of religion in the life of people and challenging the rabbinical elite's claim for exclusively supervising Jewish society and culture. It be, would be interesting and most rewarding to look at those aspects that attest to the subver subversiveness and criticism of this historical figure who has recently been assigned a more conservative image. Despite his connections with several rabbis, Manson did not take part in the internal discourse of the rabbinical community. Rabbi Jonathan Ibeshitz, who rejected Manson's request to be ordained as a rabbi when he visited him in 1761, probably had his suspicions and he realized that in Manson's case, boundaries had been crossed. Anyone who is active in the public sphere of German enlightenment and devotes his life to philosophy cannot at the same time be a member of the rabbinical elite, even if his commitment to religion is beyond doubt. But Madison also subverted the values and conventions accepted as traditional and backed by the rabbinical elite. As a philosopher, an early Jewish enlightenment, early masculine, he represented the new type of intellectual. This is already expressed in his 1755 work, Kohelet Musar, the first attempt in Jewish history to establish a Hebrew periodical, in which he took the position of the preacher of secular ethics, the writer who wishes to guide the public, not the rabbi or the preacher, the darshan. The values that Kohelet Musar advocates also cross the boundaries of the traditional religious ethos and subverted the popular Musa literature that was influenced by the Kabbalah. While the latter frightened its readers, warning them against hidden forces of evil and horrible punishments for those who deviate from religion, the voice of Kohelet Musar, is, in contrast, was optimistic. It placed man at the center of the world, urged its readers to go out into nature, to enjoy its beauty, to take the Fullest, fullest advantage of this world and to recognize the greatness of God from the perfection of the natural world he had created. Manson rejected atheism and was not deist, but he saw all religion, including Judaism, <coughs> as supplementing the natural religion, which requires no revelation, mediation of, of clergy, and holy scriptures. He had no need of rabbinical authorities to support him or to give him legitimacy, although he did not, he did enjoy the support of several rabbis on his B.O. project, the translation of the uh, uh, Torah into, into German. But the most profound secularization project that can be attributed to Mendelssohn was linked to his firm, uncompromising struggle against religious fanaticism. It is clear to anyone listening to Mendelssohn's voice in his writings and letters that he detested religious fanaticism and regarded it as the root of all evil in the past and the present. It ran counter to his worldview and he considered it a distortion of religion. He welcomed every sign that religious tolerance was growing and criticized religious fanaticism, in particular the forced imposition of alachic norms on, on anyone defined as a deviant by the rabbi. He therefore demanded that the religious leadership be denied the right to impose excommunication, chelem, and called on the rabbis to willingly forgo this right, which paradoxically expressed the psychology of the persecuted Jew, who in the same fashion oppresses those Jews who are under his control. In this instance, Manson is revealed as a Jewish liberal and humanist. Madison objected the sarcastic attacks on religion and its leaders of the kind level uh, in, by Voltaire in Candide, for example. But it would be a mistake to keep regarding as a modern thinker who only attempted to introduce harmony between the religion and the Enlightenment. He was aware of the political implications of his views and the theory of religious tolerance, which in fact included separation between religion and state should be considered his most significant contribution to the secularization project of the 18th century. He presented his translation of the Torah into German as a work that belonged in the sphere of culture and literature, 
and hence outside the boundaries of rabbinical supervision. When he heard about attempts to attack the Bidur, he refrained from, from a public reaction, but he totally rejected the criticism and maintained his independence and freedom. Let the rabbis be angry at me as much as they like. Nothing will move me from my position, he said in a private letter, drawing the boundary line between the rabbi and the secular intellectual, and himself, the philosopher. And there's a quote, a quote from this letter. As a matter of fact, the ferment over my unfortunate book has not troubled me in the slightest. No fanatic is easily capable of making my cold blood void, he said. My heart displays no signs of anger, concern, regret, and so forth. In the meantime, the rabbi of Altona, this Raphael Cohen, is keeping in thunder even. I do, not, I do not know his intention. He's perhaps waiting to strike until the completed book is put before him. Let him do so. I wish that he be left undisturbed and that nothing be brought to, him, to bear upon him from the outside in order to, to see what truth alone, free of all other considerations, is able to accomplish in my nation. I know that in our Jewish society, if one suggests even the slightest innovation, that's Mendelssohn, that could lead to an in, in, in important improvement, one takes the risk of facing opposition and even first, first, first question. But, he said, I've taken my life in my hands and turn my back to take the blows, let them curse, I shall bless. Something of Shi Bechapi, this is an Hebrew letter, Benatati et Gavi, Gevila Makim, Yekalenu Hema, Vani Avarech. So, uh, a very militant, I think, uh, uh, that we hear. Of course, the last thing one can say about Mendelssohn is that he was secular or that he promoted a project of secularization. In this context, it is important to understand more precisely the difference between secularization, secular, and secularism. Secularization, and that's the topic of my paper now, secularization is the historical process of the decline of religion, religious institutions, and the spokesman of religion in modern society, attended by the advent of human autonomy, humanistic thought, and appreciation of the life in this world. But the term secular defines, I believe, the social identity of the person, and secularism is a modern project and ideology. And I'm not sure if the 18th, in the 18th century we can speak about a total, no, a full-fledged type of a secular Jew or about secularism as ideology, but we can uh, talk about the process of secularization going on uh, in this century. The paradox is, is that the reader of Mendes on Jerusalem might get the impression that it is almost a text of religious fundamentalism, although the book was not written by a rabbi, but by a secular intellectual. But Mendelssohn's enlightenment was, as I've already stated, distinctly secularizing. His call to embrace nature, his rational critical thought, his independent stance in his life, his zealous preservation of that independence in the face of his critics, his rejection of rabbinical right to supervise and to punish, his, actively, his activity outside the circle of the rabbinical elite as an autonomous, autonomous philosopher, his effort to foster a humanistic liberal worldview, and above all, his uncompromising war against religious fanaticism, discrimination, persecution, and coercion, his revulsion even at superstition and prejudice, which he regarded as barbaric, and his belief that only religious tolerance would ensure human dignity. All of these are indications to Mendelssohn's secularizing enlightenment. In 1782, Mendelssohn experienced what he called his most happiest hour. Early in that year, impressed by Lessing Nathan the Wise, Joseph II reforms, and Christian Wilhelm von Dorn essay on the, on the improvement of civil status of the Jews, Mendelssohn's secularizing enlightenment reached its climax. 
and it was most powerfully expressed in the radical declaration that summed up the principles of religious tolerance. Manson directed it on March 19, 1782, at the rabbinical elite, whom he had called upon to give up the right to impose excommunication, and let me read it in full. I know of no rights over either persons or things which can possibly have any connection with or dependence on doctrine. Still less do I know of any right and power of opinions that are supposed to be conferred by religion. True, divine religion means neither arms nor fingers for its use. It is all spirit and heart. I shall forbid speaking of the danger there is in trusting anyone with the power of communicating with the abuse inseparable, inseparable from, the right, from the right of anathema, as indeed with every other form of church discipline or religious power. So a few weeks later, he became even more radical. Never before had he permitted himself to express, express such, such blatant words when he referred to Rabbi Raphael Cohen of Hamburg, who continued to persecute Jews who deviated from the religious norms or when he defended his Berlin friend Naftali Herz Wesley, who had been attacked by several rabbis because of his proposal for the reform of, of Jewish education. Alas, he said, referring to religious fanaticism, it will require ages yet before the human race shall have recovered from the blows which those monsters inflicted on him, on it. Throughout the Wesley affair, Madison worked behind the scene in, 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 in his defense. God knows that my heart turned over in my breast. Benison shared his feelings at the time with Joseph Gallico, secretary of the Trieste community. He was furious by the injustice that had been done and accused the rabbis and said the following. My close friend, Rabbi Hels Wesley, who fears God and reverse his, uh, and reverse his name, who has always walked the path of the righteousness, and now, in Divrei Shalom Ve'emet, words of peace and truth, he has arisen to strengthen weak hands and awaken sleepers from the slumber of the idol. And he has been assailed by men of hatred who inflict suffering on him and persecute him, as if, heaven forbid, he has incited all the people of Israel against their heavenly father. To this extent has come the folly of the heartless who know not left from right and the wickedness of those who criticize him and seek to take out the eyes of those who see their defects. Again, Hebrew uh, original is a better. At ko igia ivelet hasreb lev, asher lo yadu ben yeminam lismolam, uzdon acholkim arutsim lenaker et ene aroim et muma. It was clear almost from the outset that the Vesely affair had shifted from controversy over the reform of Jewish education to a rupture between the rabbinical elite, which sought to protect its status and authority, and the new elite of masculine. In Vesely's first attempt at defending himself, he took advantage of Madison's public approach to the rabbis, when in 1782 he called upon them to relinquish their authority to impose punishment, and actually Vesely translated this uh, into a uh, Hebrew and published in the, uh, in the second uh, epistle of the Vrai Shalom Vedemir. This challenging statement against religious coercion was in fact understood as a declaration of rebellion. His words did not escape the rabbi's attention and it seemed that Mendelssohn might pay a heavy price for his uncompromising stand at Vesely's side. The, f uh, the famous rabbi of Prague, Hanoda Yehuda, Rabbi Yecheskel Nanda, wrote them to the rabbi of Berlin, Zvi Yerushalayim, that at last we got the final proof that those who suspected his loyalty to the Jewish religion, Manson's loyalty to Jewish religion, uh, were right. Now we see that every offense we have found him to be guilty of was all true. He has declared of himself that he is no share in the God of Israel, not in his Torah, and that every man may do as his heart desires. Well, Landau's accusation didn't do justice to Madison, but this time his opposition to the rabbinical elite was clear, and he did not avoid confrontation, but argued passionately that Judaism is not a religion of coercion, and stated furiously that the denial of freedom demeans Judaism in the eyes of the Gentiles. Not only did it help basically behind the scene, but he also joined David Freelander, 
in, threaten, in a threatening letter that he and five others sent in May 1782 to the rabbis of Poland who had attacked Bethlehem. That important and revealing letter, which I was lucky to discover during my work on Madison biography, contained an ultimatum. Either I, I either withdraw in public, or they would be silenced by the rulers of the state. We even have the option of asking the king of Poland, they said, to intervene in the matter. We shall do whatever is in our power to save our friend from the hands of his enemies. And who knows how far this can go, and Manson is one of those who signed this letter. To sum up, contrary to the common knowledge, Moses Mendelssohn was not responsible for good or bad for the major events that drastically changed the face of Jewish people in the modern era. But hopefully, by listening to his voice as I brought uh, them to you, to your attention today, we could in a certain way enter his mind and share some of his feelings and even to realize what made him angry and what made his good blood boil. <clears throat> so the story of man's own life and thought reflects the early dilemma with which the modern situation confronted the Jews. His standing in the public sphere shows that a secular intellectual elite could emerge that was not in that, uh, and that was not in that identified with the rabbinical elite and did not draw its knowledge and authority from the traditional religious sources uh, on it. He marks the advent of humanistic and liberal Jewish thought that strives to promote religious tolerance. So I hope that my talk has contributed to rebalance a little bit the picture we have of medicine, because I believe that he strongly, that he strongly projects the intensity of the dramatic cultural conflict that dramatically split Jewish modernist and non-modernist and that in his case, religious commitment did not exclude the promotion of the Jewish secularizing enlightenment. Thank you very much.